Welcome all of you to our fifth seminar on research data management and HPC. We have today here Florian Willems from the University of uh, Cologne and he's going to uh, freely talk about uh, a, a topic of galaxies and genes, the complexity of research data management in HPC. So this is your uh, this is your moment, Florian. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to start off with a caution. I'm not going to present anything because um, there were no really meaningful pictures I could show you except for the data life cycle. And I think everybody knows that. Um, so, and I, I think reading down bullet points is a distraction and not something which enforces the talk. So I'm just going to talk about galaxy and genes. Maybe a few words about me. I'm a co-speaker of the uh, C3RDM, the Cologne Competence Center for Research Data Management. And uh, originally I started in classical archaeology and uh, expanded my uh, sphere of knowledge into digital archives and so landed in research data management. Basically, I've been doing that for the last 20 years. Um, yeah, um, let's start with the question, what is RDM in this context we're talking about now? RDM's aim should be, in my opinion, to keep and to protect research data, which was generated by researchers. So far, so good. Why do we do that? The first thing, very practical, is we want to have accountability to the funding agencies who funded the research. And uh, we want to keep track of the data life cycle. We want to make our data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, because most of the data we work with was quite expensive or necessitates quite a workload to get, basically, so there's no sense in throwing it away. Um, this involves infrastructure to store the data, to make it available, to present it, but also to calculate things with the data, so like HPC. And it involves consultancy because most researchers and that's something which has its root in medieval times. Even uh, the archivists of yore um, always had to fight with the scientists so that the scientists left their notes in an ordered, structured, and meaningful manner. Um, so consultancy is a very, very important point that the researchers get the problem of storing and organizing data right. Research data management is also expensive because we need infrastructure, because we need consultancy. And what's more, especially in the context of HPC, it doesn't make for good press releases. So if you say, hey, we have a super duper repository software which can store 20 petabytes of data and everybody can search it, it's not the same as look at our nice, shiny, new, giant computer. So that's a problem, but also it's not that bad because research data management is not that visible, which makes for clear settings in which you can talk to the researchers. Um, it's also always the question we're always confronted with is who does the metadata entry? Who does the quality, quality control of the data? Who cares for data reduction and stuff like that? So um, the consultancy part is a big part. The infrastructure part is also a big part. That's basically what research data management is about, to store the data, to organize it, to present it to the public, to make it reusable and findable to other researchers, and generally to facilitate that which we, which us Germans call Quellenkritik. HPC, on the other hand, deals with large computers, shiny stuff, 
bleeding edge technology, especially if the buzzwords currently uh, traveling around the net, like AI and stuff are directly related to HQC. And um, it is one of the most powerful tools in the chest of current researchers. Domain-based machine learning is a thing. And so I come to the title of my talk, Galaxies and Genes. These are, from my point of view at the University of Cologne, the two most, uh, the two biggest customers of the HPC. The astrophysicists on the one hand with a gigantic data sets, and on the other hand, uh, the medical uh, faculty with their patient data and their genome data and their MRT data and stuff like that. But these two customers, I would like to reduce it at the moment to these two disciplines, because if we now get into the question of research data management with large scale language models, we open a whole other can of worms. So let's keep it on the traditional domain based machine learning track and look at astrophysicists. Basically, astrophysicists would, in the end, if you talk to them for quite a long time, they would like to have an observatory mindset, a completely robotic data factory. You put a proposal in, I would like to have uh, time on the HPC system in Uzumukul um, to calculate the following things. The proposal gets reviewed by real persons, but everything after that, in the best of all possible worlds, would be totally automated. So. In the proposal would be which data they want to calculate, uh, they want to um, calculate on, um, where it resides, which codes they want to use, and what format the output should have. So proposal in, proposal review, if accepted, everything runs automatically. This would not be possible without a very, very sophisticated research data management. I'll come to the finer points later. On the other hand, you have the geneticists and scientists who research aging and mitochondrial relations and stuff like that. And um, their requirements are a little different. It all starts when the genome is of human origin. Then the real trouble starts because then you have to care for quite a lot of security measures because personal data is very, very protected. And if it's medical data, it's even more protected. And if this is a large scale research uh, project, then you have the problem of really large scale data, which needs to be protected in a way that is way more complicated than banking data. Banking data is not as protected as research data when it comes to medical research on humans. This necessitates quite a lot more of consulting work because first of all, you have to raise the awareness in the scientists who produce the data and who want to work with the data. And this is quite difficult because it takes time off their research time. On the other hand, you have to have a clear responsibility. Who's responsible for the security of the data? Is it the person who runs the infrastructure? Is it the person who runs the repository software? Is it the person who runs the HPC system? Or is it the scientist who provides the data? These are questions with quite a large legal footprint, which have to be decided on before the first bit of data is stored. Um, and to get these decisions, you need certification of hardware systems. You need certification of technical and organizational methods. You need certification of processes. So you have a quite a large baggage of uh, administrative tasks without which you can't do your research. So on the one hand, you have the astrophysicists who want a robotic observatory proposal in data out. And on the other hand, you have the medical researchers who need to be sure that the data will not leak. 
So in both cases, you would need someone with a final responsibility and with the power to say no in some cases. Because if you don't have someone who has the power to make decisions, which all the others have to adhere to, you end up like the German transport infrastructure. You have a patchwork of responsibilities. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Even the fingers don't know about each other and nothing will work and everybody will tell you it's not that easy. So one of the most important things is that you have a clear hierarchy of power when it comes to safety of data and when it comes to decisions, how data should be stored, annotated, and how metadata schemes should work and stuff like that. Um, what both disciplines have in common is the size of the data. When you talk to, let's say, medievalists and they do transcriptions of documents, uh, they have a few pictures and they have a few XML documents and for them, a terabyte is quite a lot of space. When you talk to astrophysicists, well, then they tell you that the next instrument or the next telescope will output three terabyte per day. So research data management starts at the instrument and with questions like how to get three terabytes of data a day from the Atacama to Cologne, for example. That's a real world example, by the way. Um, so research data management in HPC relies on technical knowledge of storage solutions, of network speed, of data security, and also of data security for sensible data. So this is a two-folded thing and we don't want to have a separate storage system and a totally separate process pipeline for astrophysicists and a totally separate process pipeline for geneticists. It would be nice if we just had one system which can work with both, even if the requirements are quite different. Because every system adds to complexity, I don't have to tell you that. Um, one of the things research data management at the moment explores when it comes to storage size and especially staging of data to HPC systems is manual tiering so that uh, the hierarchical storage systems don't tier automatically, but that the scientist can say, okay, I want this data set and this data set out of the cold archive and I want to calculate something with it. So manual tiering would be something which us research data managers would very much like if it could be made easy. Um, storage si space size is a problem, but with especially in Northern Westphalia, with all the initiatives uh, concerning data storage, uh, Northern Westphalia and data archive, um, I think we're on a good way to have a institutionalized um, consortial way of storing large amounts of data. And there are ideas to include the extra university research institutions also in the storage network. And if we work quite clever and do staging and uh, tiering to the locations where the HPC systems is in a clever way, um, we basically have the aim of having a object storage system which is geo-replicated and from which data can be manually tiered to the staging systems at the locations of the HPC systems. That would be one of the ideas we at the moment really follow up on. Um, but that comes with the price of data security because if you geo-replicate patient data, well, then every system has to be certified and uh, tested and that won't work out. So we have to add an additional layer of uh, encryption and that slows things down. And that is one of the points which I want to put to discussion later. How you think we can work with one storage system and hearing system when it comes to especially sensitive data. I have some more questions concerning sensitive data. Um, this is basically a legal question. 
but with large technical implications. Um, one of the other things which always comes up when one talks about research data management, especially when it comes to data sets which are malleable over time, for example, because somebody had an instrument data set and they discovered the instrument had a slight uh, diversion from their norms and they do a second version with the same data but with a correction. So you have different versions. Um, the thing would be to store versions of all data sets, which when it comes to the petabyte range is quite a lot to do. So one of the questions I also want to put up for discussion is, um, are deltas enough? Is it enough to store only the difference between the data sets or do we really need the data set? Also quite critic. Um, this whole versioning thing, that's a big layer of complexity, not only for the admins, but also for the users. Because if one follows an old link, which was written down somewhere and he gets an old version of the data set and produces new data with other data sets, then this whole exercise was for naught. So um, versioning is something which, especially in the context of the large data sets which concern HPC, is complicated. Um, the next point is research software management, which just takes off at the moment, in my opinion. Um, is it possible to ensure that your codes will run in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years time? Um, there are codes from the 1980s written in a standard C++, which still run on today's HPC systems without a hitch. But as soon as somebody starts moving bits with, let's say, Python, this reproducibility goes down to maybe two to three years, five if everything is okay. So what to do about research software management? One idea would be extreme mitigation. Every piece of software which, you, which uh, shovels bytes and do, does calculations has to be programmed in something totally and utterly standard like C++ with a very small set of external dependencies or Rust emerges at the moment as a new possibility. But if you have to use Python, just use it as a wrapper because if you move bits with Python, it's not that easy anymore to make the software reusable in, let's say, 20 years' times. Virtual machines and dockers are a possibility to mitigate that, but uh, there also comes the problem of proprietary software and binary dumps and stuff like that. So another question is how do we do research software management when we think about long-term data archives? Um, fair data, I think we're all of the same opinion that it's a good idea to make the data fair, which when it comes to patient data is simply not possible because patient data can't be shared and freely distributed. So there's always quite a lot of ifs and buts when it comes to fair data and medical research. The astrophysicists on the other hand have no problem with fair data, none whatsoever. Um, and if you talk about fair data, and especially if you talk about fair data for reproducibility and uh, wissenschaftliche Gründlichkeit, you need to pack the data with the codes which produced the results which were published. So there you have the problem of packaging things in a meaningful way. And all of this gains a lot more complexity as soon as we talk about long-term archival storage. Because then we have to have preservation planning, then we have to have format policies. And then come questions like, okay, a format is now obsolete, but the data which is stored in this format is highly sensitive. So in 10 years time, in 20 years time, who is responsible for the data and who is allowed to open the data to, con to convert the format into a new format? And how will this be 
documented in a way that can be audited, for example. Or if somebody withdraws their um, somebody doesn't want their data to be used anymore, which by German law is totally allowed. How do you then prune the data sets? Who can do that? These are definitely questions for which concern the long time, uh, long term viability of uh, HPC data, especially in the public sector when it comes to healthcare. Um, what about shadow copies? If you have sensitive data, how does it have to be encrypted so that you can allow shadow copies at different locations, which maybe don't adhere 100% to the technical organizational means which you took for granted at your home institution? Um, and then come the whole baggage of fair and care. If somebody does uh, care principles, I don't know if they are known, but uh, they concern, they're quite new, and they concern the rights to your own data, especially when it comes, for example, to medical research. So you have a German university, which together with a German pharmaceutical company, researches uh, some vector-based disease or other in a country in the global south. So you have people there who provide their data, and um, the question is, who owns the right to the data? So there's this whole legal baggage, which no sane system administrator would touch with a 10 foot pole, but without which we can't do research data management. So this is a totally unsolved problem. Um, information loss has to be tracked. If by one or another event, information gets lost. How do we document that when it comes to scientific responsibility of documenting where your data resides and what you do with it? Um, the pipelines which created the data and which were used to store the data, they need to be very, very well, well documented. And um, one of the questions is how do you manage this documentation? So you have a form of meta research data management. How do you manage the documentation of the documentation? Um, I think metadata is the key for all that. And for this reason, standardized metadata schemes are quite a great thing. On the other hand, most of them are much too complex and this leads to the people who have to do the metadata entry, not using them in the right way, but using shortcuts. And as everybody who does, who does hiking and wandering knows, we don't have time for shortcuts. So this is another problem. Metadata schemes are so friggin' important, but they can't be complex because otherwise nobody will use them. On the other hand, if you have a very simple metadata scheme, it might not be able to correctly um, show what is what and how it got there. This is a very thin knife's edge. Um, and at the end, I would really propose that, especially for the observatory mindset with the robotic data factory, but also for um, the very, very complex um, models of user access rights, which are necessary for uh, patient data research, that the archive needs to be at the center of the whole project. This is maybe a little bit very much the um, research data management perspective, especially when talking to HPC people. But on the other hand, there's no HPC without data. And to get the data, you need to know that it's correct, where it's from, who can access it, how long will it be stored, where will it be stored, and all these things. So the archive, in my opinion, is a very, very central point to all projects in the realm of science which use HPC. 
with these things, I would like to enter the discussion because, as I said, I think I posed some questions which are discussable. Thank you for listening. Okay, so interesting, interesting format and um, uh, astounding that you can so freely talk about uh, everything. So uh, I, I think you are uh, really into the stuff and you are really an expert. Uh, let me uh, just uh, uh, pick up on, on, on two things uh, that I see also problematic on, on our HPC, and that is uh, software, uh, keeping software. We have a huge collection of software with a huge collection of version of these softwares. And I really wonder how, how, this, how this is going on, how this will, will continue. <laughs> um, is, I mean, is there, is there, any, is there any idea how, how to centralize that? Because uh, our system is going to explode if we continue uh, installing versions of new software. Because people demand uh, every month a new version of software. That's crazy. Yep. Uh, and that boils down to how do you reproduce the results with a newer version of the software or with an older version and stuff like that. Yeah, that is a problem. And I think we're not there yet at the point where we can answer that for sure. But the funding agencies uh, in the last year started to put uh, not only a part about research data management into uh, the funding proposal templates, but also a part about research software management. And as far as I know, there are some initiatives to get uh, Lehrstühle for software research management in uh, North Rhine Westphalia at the moment, which would be quite a good idea because, as you said, this is a still unsolved problem. And no, I don't know how you would manage uh, the 25,000 names of uh, anybody. Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. you. The, the other thing is uh, uh, metadata, standardization of metadata. This is, this is, I see, this is going to be a big, a very, very big issue. Because uh, on, the, on the one hand, um, I mean, as, as a scientist, I know that I just want to do my research. Yeah? I don't want to care about research data. So we in, uh, in, in the M group of HPC and NR, NRW, uh, we are we are looking to to find a way to make things easier for the um, uh, for the scientists, uh, but but then on the other hand, of course, we we don't know what is important uh, on 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 what metadata to 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 keep uh, and well, that there needs that there has to happen something, uh, and uh, we really need input also from uh, from the users, which metadata is is important. And uh, as you already say, I mean, in, in twenty years. Uh, you want to search for the data and you, you will never find it if your metadata is not defined in a correct way. That's, yep. that's, that's an issue. And also responsibility, who is, who is responsible in 20 years for, for the data? So, uh, professor leaves the university, classic, classical case, uh, uh, and what, what then? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, concerning this, um, let's start at, at a lower level of organizational uh, complexity. Um, if you have, for example, a CRC and it runs through the whole three funding periods, it's 12 years. And you're by law required to store everything for 10 years after the end of the CRC. That is way not enough these 10 years. But on the other hand, if you start a CRC, you need to think about 22 years in the future when it comes to your data integrity. And that is something which slowly, slowly permeates the people who write the funding applications. And most of them are quite flabbergasted when they think about it. And that's where the consulting part of research data management comes in. But I don't have a solution for that, except that lots of disciplines have their own metadata standards, which are for years now in use, use them. And every, everywhere else, my, 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 my opinion is keep it simple, stupid. KISS principle all the way around when it comes to metadata, otherwise nobody will use it. You can have something like the CDOC CRM. It's a metadata ontology to describe real-world objects in museums. It's an RDF ontology with, I think, 
1,700 uh, entities which uh, reside in another four-digit number of relations to every to everything else. Yeah, that's total totally nice humanity's brain fuck, but nobody will use it. So the, the knife edge between usable and hinreichend complex, that's the way to go, in my opinion. And then when, you, when it comes to consortial projects like HPC uh, North and Westphalia, where you have, um, where the idea is to have interchangeable data on interchangeable HPC systems when something drops out and stuff like that, then you have a standardization within the consortium because otherwise you can't interchange anything. And you have to standardize the software used on the HPC systems because otherwise they come with version, uh, with version number 2753 release candidate three. Yeah. But there only resides uh, version number 2753 release candidate one. And so mm -hmm. you're fucked. Yeah. Um, you have to work on standardizing the pipelines and the communication. That's, that's the layer where you have to get at it. Not at the, okay, I can do hot stuff with it layer. As I said, research data management is so not sexy and does so not make for good press releases, but it's darn important. Yeah. I see. You won't that. have the minister when you uh, inaugurate a new repository system, but you will have a minister if you inaugurate a new HPC computer.